Good Sabbath, everyone. Let's worship the Lord together with In Christ Alone by Stuart Townend. Published in 2002, Townend wrote this song in collaboration with Keith Getty. The words reflect on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the implications of those events on our lives. After I play, Alan will come with the announcements and the opening prayer. Thank you, Jackie. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. To this, uh, welcome to this uh, Sabbath day, and it's good to be back. We really enjoyed visiting our brethren in Knoxville, Tennessee, and in Nebraska, but it is good to be back. I noticed the full moon a couple days ago. What does that mean? Well, that means that we're just under three months away from this year's Feast of Tabernacles. It'll be here soon. If you'd like to join us this year, we'll be meeting in the Sevierville, Tennessee area near the Great Smoky Mountains. And of course, everyone is welcome. We'll be having a fellowship meal each day after services. And of course, we'll have Bible studies and other activities. And there's certainly plenty to do and see in the area. If you'd like more information about this year's feast, and just check out our website. Or you can always just give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Whether it's about the feast or if you'd just like to chat. You can give us a call at the number on your screen right now. And if you plan to attend the feast with us this year, please register on our website or give us a call and let us know. That helps us to plan our menus and arrange our seating. I know we're looking forward to this year's Feast of Tabernacles, and we hope you are too. I think that's about it for the announcements today. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your weekly Sabbath day and all your holy days. We thank you for the knowledge that you bring us, and we thank you for your Son, who gave us life that we might have life. We have many today, Father, that are sick and injured, 
Some are suffering hardship. Some are facing medical procedures. Please be with them all. Please comfort them and take care of them. And please be with all of us as we go through these uncertain times. And please bless and inspire our service here today, of course. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first hymn is on page 254 in the Blue Hymnal, The Church's One Foundation. This hymn text by Samuel Stone was written in 1866 during a period of controversy in the church over the way to interpret the Bible. It is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's page 254, The Church's One Foundation. church is one foundation is jesus christ her lord she is his new creation by water and the word from him he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood he bought her and for Charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. His saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes out how long. And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and to of her war. She waits the consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and God's new church victorious shall be the church at Our second hymn will be singing page 84, His Name is Great. This hymn by Dwight Armstrong is based on Psalm 76 and reflects on how all nations will fear or respect our Creator. He will defeat even the bravest warrior to save the meek. That's page 84, His Name is Great. God is known and feared. In Israel his name is great. His tent in Salem he hath reared. His royal seat in Zion hath made. There he broke arrows of the bow, the shield, the sword, and war's array. More excellent, O Lord, art thou more glorious far than hills of prey. The stout of heart are spoiled in fight, a deadly sleep the warrior slept. No hand of all the men of might is wanted strength or cunning kept. O Jacob's God at thy command, the chariot and the horse went down. For thou art fearful, who can stand in the tempest of thy frown? From heaven God his judgment gave, the trembling earth stood still and feared. When all the meek on earth to save, for righteous judgment God appeared. Let all around their presence breathe. 
to him whom all the world should fear. He cuts off princes, God the King, faithful to earth's king shall appear. And now for our message today, Alan Holt with Satan's Plan. Welcome, everyone, to today's Sabbath service. We're glad you're here. You know, it's such a great thing to come to know our Creator and to come to know the great plan He has for us. Now, I think most of us are familiar with God's plan of salvation, the basic plan anyway. And we may not know all the minute details perfectly, but we have God's holy days to show us His plan, and it's a good plan. It's actually much better than the one that most identifying as Christians today understand. You know, many think that if we simply acknowledge Christ's existence, we go to heaven for eternity. And if we're unlucky enough to have never heard of Jesus, well, then we're tormented forever in a physical burning fire. But no one's ever explained how our immortal soul or spirit, if you will, can suffer physical pain, yet be a spirit being without a physical body. That doesn't make any sense. But we are coming to know God's real plan, and it's far better than that. But today, how many people in the world understand God's plan? How many people understand God? His holy days, His laws, who He really is, and what He truly has in store for our future. Today, many believe God's commandments, or the law, has been done away with. Of course, from 1 John 3, verse 4, we know that sin is the transgression of the law. Of course, if the law was done away with, then there can be no sin, and I think we all know better than that. God's holy days are basically unknown to most, and sadly, most don't have a very accurate understanding of God, who He is, and His true plan of salvation. Why? Well, I believe this is primarily due to Satan's influence. You see, God is not the only one who has a plan for us. Satan has a plan, too. But how many of us are familiar with Satan's plan? You know, in warfare, it's important to know what the enemy's up to, what his plan is. Otherwise, it can be difficult to defend against it. And we need to know what Satan's up to, what his plan is, what his tactics are, so we can defend against that. Today, I'd like to take a look at Satan's plan. Let's see just how well his plan is working. Let's begin today by turning to Isaiah 14, verse 12. That's Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. We'll start there today. To determine how well Satan's plan is working, we need to know his objective. What does he want to accomplish? What is Satan's goal? Again, that's Isaiah 14, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Satan wants to have his own throne. Satan wants to be our God. Let's continue in verse 13. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan wants to be like God. In fact, Satan wants to be our God. Turn to Matthew 4, verse 1. That's Matthew chapter 4, and we'll begin in verse 1. Now, Satan wants to be worshipped like God. He wants us to worship him rather than worship the true God. Satan even tried to get Jesus to worship him. Let's read about that now in Matthew chapter 4. Again, that's verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter, that's Satan, came to him, he said, 
If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. But Satan wasn't giving up. Notice what Satan promises Jesus in verses 8 and 9. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said to him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Satan was trying to get Christ to worship him. In fact, Satan was trying to bribe Jesus into worshiping him, rather than, of course, the one true God. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. So we see that Satan wanted Jesus to turn away from worshiping the true God, he wanted Christ to fall down and worship him. But notice that, uh, did Jesus fall for that? No, of course not. But note that Jesus quoted scripture to defend himself against Satan's attack. Satan directly asked Jesus to worship him. He tried to bribe Christ with the kingdoms of this world. That obviously didn't work very well for Satan. Jesus answered Satan with scripture. And we should do the same. Today, does Satan appear to us and just say, worship me? Not exactly. I think maybe he learned his lesson when he failed to get Jesus to worship him back then. And really, neither Jesus or his followers are likely to follow Satan just for the asking, even with an obvious bribe, maybe. But Satan's tactics are typically much more subtle than that. Genesis 3, verse 1. If you would turn to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1 there. Now, Satan knows that most people won't just leave Christ and follow him just for the asking, although a few probably will. You might notice that in the Garden of Eden, Satan didn't directly ask Eve to follow him. Instead, he used subtle deception to get Eve to break one of God's commandments and therefore commit sin, to follow what Satan wanted for her, and actually all of mankind. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now Satan knew that God had forbidden them to eat of one tree, that one in the middle of the garden. Eve knew that, as we'll see in the next two verses. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, as we know, the penalty for sin is death. And Eve knew better than to eat of that forbidden fruit. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. No. Satan was lying to Eve. Satan was using deception to draw Eve away from God and his commandments. We'll see he furthers this deception in verse 5. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
We see in verse 6 that Eve did what she thought was right in her own eyes. Listening to Satan rather than believing and trusting God. Let's see that in verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, again, Eve believed the lie from Satan. She didn't trust God. She trusted Satan here. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Satan used deception to entice Eve to sin to break God's commandment. So did Eve die as God said she would if she disobeyed? Well, yes, she did. But Satan used a lie to deceive Eve. Drop down to verse 13, if you would. Just a few verses down. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The word beguiled here in the King James is the Hebrew word 5377 in Strong's. It's nashal in Hebrew. It means to lead astray, to delude, to seduce, or to deceive. So from Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, we learn that Satan was the more subtle, he was more subtle than any beast of the field. His plan is to divert Christians from following God and take up his ways. And as we've seen, his plan is to use deception and, in many cases, bribery. You see, Satan promises something that sounds really good. And he tells us that there will be no repercussions for breaking God's commandments and following his ways. Now, we know that God has a great plan for us. But Satan has a plan for us, too. But right now, whose plan appears to be working the best? Well, look at the world around us. Does the world as a whole appear to be following God? Or do they appear to be following Satan? Crime, destruction, violence. Does this come from God? Or does it come from Satan? What about sexual sin today? We hear a lot about that. Now, just as Satan promised Eve, sin, in this case sexual sin, might be fun for a season. But ultimately, it brings sorrow and regret. So it might appear that Satan's plan is succeeding, that God's plan is failing. But hold on, it isn't over quite yet. But the world today certainly seems to be falling for Satan's plan. We see it every day. Should we be surprised? Not really. We know that Revelation 12 verse 9 tells us that Satan deceives the whole world. So how has Satan used his primary tools of deception and bribery? As I said earlier, most Christians no longer have God's holy days. Many no longer have God's laws. Few actually attempt today to keep the Ten Commandments. So where did God's holy days and His commandments go? Well, they were taken away by Satan using mostly deception and bribery. I'd like to mention, by the way, that most of Satan's deception comes in the form of counterfeits. Similar to what God does, but wrong. Counterfeits. They're a worthless substitute for the real thing. And as I said, Satan is very subtle. He slowly moves us away from God and toward himself. He rarely just says, stop following God and follow me. Instead, it's more like the death by a thousand cuts. A little deception at a time. Each little cut or deception seems small and often insignificant. But they just keep coming and they start to add up. Over time, Satan turns those who set out to worship the true God and the following his ways. If you look around even at many Christian churches today, we see that even they have been deceived into practices that violate God's law, things that the apostles would have never imagined. 
But this has happened so slowly and so subtly that most of us, well, we just don't think about it. It seems fairly normal to many of us today, having changed over hundreds of years slowly. And so for most of Christianity, God's annual holy days have morphed into holidays. The word holiday comes from, the, from holy day. Originally, this was a day set aside by God. But only God can create a holy day. The term holiday, over time, has come to mean something totally different anymore. Now look at dictionary.com for the definition of the word holiday. Now, one of the definitions is that of an actual holy day. Let me read that to you. This is from dictionary.com. It says, A religious feast day, holy day, especially any of several usually commemorative holy days observed in Judaism. But this wasn't the first and most common definition listed. In fact, it was way down the list at number four. I suspect that one day that definition will disappear entirely. Let's look it up more common definition for holiday from dictionary.com. Now, the first definition listed there is this. Holiday is a day fixed by law or custom on which ordinary business is suspended in commemoration of some event or in honor of some person. So today, God's holy days have largely been forgotten replaced by days that honor or commemorate some event or some person. We have holidays. Are they really holy days? That are no longer, they no longer have anything to do with God, but rather with men. Let's look at the second definition listed in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Here it is. It is any day of exemption from work. Any day off work is a holiday. In other words, any day we don't have to work is a holiday. So by definition, I've had holidays due to winter weather that made traveling to work impractical. That day off, well, that was a holiday. But is there any religious significance here? Are these holidays something declared by God? Well, no, of course not. The third definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary a time or a period of exemption from any requirement, duty, assessment, etc. For example, new businesses may be granted a one-year tax holiday. The use of the word holiday here has absolutely nothing to do with God. And per the British, a holiday is a period of cessation from work or one of recreation, a vacation. A day or time for man, but not for God. Holy days to holidays. Honoring an event or a person. Then to just any day off work. Just a vacation. God is nowhere to be found in most holidays today. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, if you would. So over time, it seems that God's commanded holy days have morphed into the holidays of today. But these are totally man-made. They often include a day off work, as did God's original holy days. However, they were created by man, not by God. Man has added holidays, but eliminated all of God's holy days, every one of them. So what does God have to say about that? Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. You shall not add to, nor diminish from it. Whether religious sounding in nature or not, man's holidays do not follow God's commanded holy days. We've actually taken away God's original holy days and added in their place man's holy days, now called holidays. But holidays, again, created by man, not by God. So, what happened to God's declared holy days? The ones listed in Leviticus 23, for example. Well, 
For most Christians, the weekly Sabbath holy day has vanished in favor of Satan's counterfeit, the day of the sun. And those who observe the counterfeit Sabbath day no longer observe it in the manner God instructed us to do. You see, once, begin, once people began keeping a different day other than the one God declared, they began doing things like working on that day rather than resting as God commands. An entire day that was set aside at creation for our rest and the worship of our Creator has been reduced in many cases to an hour-long worship service. The rest of the day, it's not special. People go to work, they shop, or do whatever they would do on any other day of the week. A little compromise here and another one there. Before long, we can't even remember where we even started from. God's seven annual holy days, what happened to them? Well, they vanished too. They were replaced by the counterfeit holidays we just spoke of. Again, the world drifts slowly but surely away from God. Some of our holidays, such as Christmas and Easter, claim to honor Christ. But as time continues to pass, even the facade of honoring Christ has all but disappeared. For example, today, Christmas is more about Santa Claus and giving gifts to each other than about Jesus Christ. It seems that Christ is often forgotten about in all the hubbub. Many churches report that offerings are down during the Christmas season as people are spending money on giving gifts to each other, despite the claim that it's the birthday of Christ, which, of course, we know isn't the case anyway. About the only thing most children know about Easter is that they go on Easter egg hunts and get chocolate bunnies and peeps. Again, we slide farther and farther away from God as we buy into Satan's deception. Maybe how are some of us tempted to accept these holidays, if you will? How are we tempted? He was tempted by fruit that looked good and was said to make her wise. We saw Jesus, I'm sorry, we saw Satan tempted Jesus by offering him all the kingdoms of the world. What about us? Particularly our children. You know, it's easier to start with children before they can even read the Bible. After all, many adults become stuck in their ways. By the time we're adults, we already have most of our beliefs formed. Children are more impressionable. They're much easier to sway. Once we learn these things, they tend to stay with us. So, on Halloween, we see churches celebrating trick-or-treat, or they might call it trunk-or-treat, but they give children candy to keep them observing and remembering this holiday. The children are tempted by the promise of getting a lot of candy. Now, is a lot of candy good for them? Well, in the end, probably not. But like the forbidden fruit, it sounded good to them at the time. Yeah, the same thing at Easter. As I said, chocolate bunnies and things like that. And of course, at Christmas, it's usually about toys. Their toys are used to bribe children into basically worshiping Santa Claus instead of the true God. So we see blatant bribery to draw people, especially children, toward these holidays. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, verse 32, I'll just read this, tells us, you shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Let's turn over, if you would, to Matthew 18, verse 6. That's Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Today, we're seeing the results of the turning aside from God's commandments. But we're not done yet. It's bad enough for the adults to turn away from God's holy days to Satan's counterfeits. But what about teaching our children to do so? What about that? What if we teach our children to observe these, these counterfeit holy days called holidays? Mark 18, verse 6. I'm sorry, Matthew 18, verse 6. But whoso shall offend, now the word offend here means to trip up, stumble, or enticed to sin. So, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths 
of the sea. Ouch. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. Should we keep God's commanded holy days or men's holidays? So what should we be teaching our children? Again, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. And these words, now these are the words of God. These words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. Now, that's what we should be teaching our children. The things that God has commanded us to. But what's the focus of most Christians during the holiday season? What do they most often teach their children? They teach them about shopping, Santa Claus, gifty changes, candy rabbits, Easter egg hunts, pretty much anything except about Jesus Christ. What about the Ten Commandments? Do you think Satan would support these? Or might he want to go in the opposite direction? What about the first commandment that tells us not to place false gods before the true God? Turn over to Exodus 20, verse 3 with me, if you would. That's Exodus 20, verse 3. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Now, Satan is obviously against all of God's commandments. In fact, Satan's against God, period. We'll just look at one of God's Ten Commandments today, just one. And that's uh, the first one in Exodus 20, verse 3. And it says, You shall have no other gods before me. Now that's the first of the Ten Commandments. I'd like us to move ahead three chapters, if you would, over to Exodus 23, verse 13. That's just a little over three chapters. That's Exodus chapter 23, verse 13. The first commandment tells us we're not to place any false gods before our Creator. I think Exodus 23, verse 13 takes this maybe a step further. Again, Exodus 23, verse 13. And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of your mouth. Well, believe it or not, it's actually become all but impossible to exist in today's world without constantly saying the names of false gods daily. You may not know what I'm talking about because so much of this is so very subtle. We rarely give it any thought. But I'd like to tell you about just the first hour of my typical day. Was I exposed to any false gods in the first hour of my typical day? Any false gods or goddesses? Did they come my way? Well, you're probably saying, no, that's not very likely that would happen. Let me tell you about a regular work day when I went to work. Did I see any of Satan's influence and deception during the first hour of my work day? Let's see. One Thursday, I had breakfast and drove to work. When I got to work, I checked my calendar to see what the day had in store for me. That all seems pretty normal. But then I looked more closely at just that first hour of the day. Let's look in detail here. Well, first, for breakfast that morning, I had a bowl of cereal. Sounds innocent enough. From Answers.com and many other sources. The word cereal originated with the name of the Roman deity, Ceres, goddess of agriculture. So the word cereal is named after a false god. Now, I went to work that day in an automobile. It turned out to be a Mercury Milan. Mercury Milan. Edsel Ford, he's the son of Henry Ford, he launched the Mercury car brand in 1938. The Mercury line was created for entry-level luxury cars that would fit between the Ford and Lincoln lines. Now, the site AutoEvolution.com had this to say about the use of the name Mercury for this line of vehicles. Quote, Named after the Roman god, known for his speed and fashionable winged sandals, the name Mercury actually seems to be of good augury, considering that the main line of activity of the Roman god Mercury was commerce. So you could say that 
in giving this name to the brand, Ford was trying to appease the gods and make it big in the car business. Close quote. And if you're wondering from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the word agri here means divination from auspices or omens. So I drove a car to work with the name of a false god on it. Okay. Now when I got to work, the first thing I did was check my calendar. That's something I do every morning as soon as I get to work. As I said earlier, the day of the week on my calendar was Thursday. Named, of course, by the Germanic god of thunder, Thor. Again, the name of a false god. Now, I believe this was on June 17th. The month of June gets its name from the goddess Juno, wife of the god Jupiter. So if you think about it, in the very first hour of my day, I was exposed to names of false gods and goddesses, names like Ceres, Mercury, Thor, and Juno. Of course, you know, we look for God's holy days. We look at them on the calendar which has been kept by the Jews, God's calendar, basically. So that's sure to be saved from paganism and false gods, right? Well, God numbered the months and the days of the month. He didn't name them. Well, I guess he did call the first mo uh, month of the year a bib. But what name did the Jews have for month four on God's calendar? They named it. The name is Tammuz. Of course, we see the name Tammuz in Ezekiel 8, verse 14. There, we're weeping more, sorry, there women were weeping for the false god Tammuz. And God calls this an abomination in verse 15. So we constantly place the name of counterfeit gods before our Creator every day. It's practically impossible to avoid it. But suddenly, over time, Satan has placed the names of many false gods in our daily lives before God. You know, in fact, I'm an amateur astronomer, and I used to follow the space program very closely. What about the names of the planets and the constellations? What about those names? They were originally named by God. Psalms 147 verse 4 tells us, and I'll read this in the contemporary English version, speaking of God, He decided how many stars there would be in the sky and gave each one a name. So God named the stars. But today, they're now all named, or I should say renamed, after false gods. The planets, for example, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc. All names of false gods. You might remember the early days of the space program. They had projects like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. One of the more famous constellations, the constellation Orion, is named after the Greek god Orion. He was said to be the son of the sea god Poseidon, by the way. So we see that pagan gods' names, pagan goddesses as well, are all around us today. But what about our Christian religious leaders? Could some of them be a part of Satan's plan to turn us away from God and his truth? Have they been deceived? And are they actively deceiving others today? I'd like to read an older article from The Independent a new source in the UK. Now, this can be found at independent.co.uk. It was written by Michael Day, dated Wednesday, September 11th, 2013. The title, Pope Francis assures atheists you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. <clears throat> Here's what he said, quote, Actually, this is what, uh, okay, let me just read this to you. In comments likely to enhance his progressive reputation, Pope Francis has written a long, open letter to the founder of La Publica newspaper, Eugenio Scalfari, stating that non-believers would be forgiven by God if they followed their consciences. Responding to a list of questions published in the paper by Mr. Scalfari, who's not a Roman Catholic, Pope Francis wrote, 
Now, this is the quote I was trying to give you, the quote from Pope Francis. Here's what he said, quote, You ask me if the God of the Christians forgive those who don't believe and who don't seek the faith. I start by saying, and this is the fundamental thing, that God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. Sin, even for those who have no faith, exists. Sin exists when people disobey their conscience. Close quote. Let me repeat that. He says, sin exists when people disobey their conscience. 1 John 3, verse 4. We mentioned that a few minutes ago. Let's turn over there, if you would, now to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Let's take a look at this. Now, the Pope appears to be claiming that sin is the disobeying of one's conscience. Let's see what the Bible says. 1 John 3, verse 4. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is, and here is God's definition basically coming from the Bible, sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is not disobeying our conscience. Sin is disobeying God's commandments or His law. That's what our Bibles tell us. You know, maybe Eve was following her conscience when she disobeyed God's commandment. But we know that didn't go well for her or for Adam. Here's another article regarding the Pope's statement. <clears throat> this is from the Washington Times. The article is written by Cheryl K. Chumley, dated Friday, May 24th, again 2013. Pope Francis has sparked a religious debate with comments made earlier this week confirming atheists can indeed go to heaven. Christian teaching generally holds that belief in Jesus and not good deeds grants eternal life. But the Pope, in a morning mass on Wednesday, suggested that belief and faith weren't the biggest factors, he said. CNN reported, The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us with the blood of Christ, all of us, not just Catholics. Everyone. A question. Father, the atheist? Even the atheist, everyone. We must meet one another doing good. Again, an objection. But I don't believe, Father. Father, I am an atheist. He continues. But do good. We will meet one another there. Turn with me now, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. That's Proverbs chapter 16 in verse 25 where we'll start. So basically just follow our conscience and that will give us salvation. In other words, just do what we think is right and that will assure us eternal life. We have no real need to have any kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. What do our Bibles say about following what seems right to us? To follow our conscience. Proverbs 16, verse 25. It tells us, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And of course, you may recall Jeremiah 9, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17, verse 9 tells us, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? No, I'm afraid we can't trust our conscience or our heart. We need God. One more article that reflects the moral and religious climate today. It's a few years old, but we see the same thing going on today. Uh, this article is from cnsnews.com, again dated October 7th of 2013. Here's what it says. The very Reverend Gary Hall is the chief ecclesiastical leader and executive officer of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. In a sermon on October 6th last year, Hall said, quote, Heterosexism is a sin, close quote. Heterosexism is a sin. Now, 
what is heterosexism? Well, I looked at the James Madison University fact and information sheet about heterosexism. Now, I found that at jmu.edu on the web, and here's what it says. Quote, Heterosexism is the assumption that all people are heterosexual, and that heterosexuality is superior and more desirable than homosexuality or bisexuality. Close quote. Therefore, according to the very Reverend Gary Hall, chief ecclesiastical leader and executive officer of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., if we happen to believe that heterosexuality is more desirable than homosexuality or bisexuality, if we think that way, then we're committing sin by doing so. And that's what some Christians teach today. So to conclude today, we see Satan has deceived the world by drawing people away from the true God and toward Satan's ways. These primarily use deception and bribery to do most of his work. We've seen him turn people away from God's holy days and away from God's true plan of salvation. We've seen how he attempts to bribe us, particularly our children, with candy and toys to distract them from worshiping the true God. We've seen how Satan has placed the names of other gods, basically representing Satan himself, all throughout society and before God today. Indeed, Satan has a plan, and I'd say it's working quite well at the moment. Most of the world has been deceived by this plan. But we need to always remember how easily we might be deceived too. We need to constantly be on the lookout for Satan's deception and pray that we can see it coming and avoid it. We know that from Matthew 24, verse 24, that if it was possible, Satan would deceive even the very elect. He would deceive us. We all need to thank God for our calling. And that we can see through so much of Satan's deception, something everyone can't, can't seem to do. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. That's Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. Now, while it might look as though Satan is winning the battle today, we know he won't win the war. In the end, we know that Satan will ultimately lose and be destroyed. We can have hope and look forward to the day when Satan is no more. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Again, this is speaking of Satan. It's a good description of him, actually. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your tabrets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you. Note the word here is destroy. Not to rule in an eternal fire of brimstone, or burn forever in said fire. But God says he will destroy Satan. Continuing. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It shall devour you. Now, this fire will devour Satan. The word devour here is the Hebrew word 398 in Strong's. It's a call. And it means to burn up or consume. 
Satan will be completely burned up. He will be no more. Still need more proof? Well, let's finish in verse 18. I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It shall devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. So Satan will be reduced to ash in that fire. And there'll be witnesses about this event, too. They'll see this. Verse 19. And they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You shall be a terror, and never shall you be anymore. Satan will be no more. He'll be burned to ash, and that will be the end of Satan. He will never again be able to deceive anyone. So, in the end, or I really should say, in the last day, Satan will be gone forever. Satan loses. God wins. And we can look forward to that great Satan-free future we'll have. It'll be wonderful, I'm sure. Can't wait. But for our, for our last scripture today, and pretty much to end today's sermon, turn with me to Romans 16, verse 17. That's Romans 16, verse 17 to wrap everything up today. We've seen how what might appear to be small deceptions can lead to the loss of great truth. Political correctness, and sometimes even traditional Christianity, aid Satan in his attack against God and God's people. We should all be very thankful that God has delivered us from so much of Satan's deception. We should always be on guard against Satan's deception. Our best defense is the Word of God. We saw Jesus use it when Satan tempted him. Our Bibles can expose any deception Satan can come up with if we study it and also pray for knowledge and wisdom. But don't follow Satan's plan. Don't be deceived. Follow God and his plan. Again, Romans 16, we'll read verses 17 through 20 to end today. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, or note them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good, and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. For our closing hymn, please turn to page 156, The Servant's Prayer. This hymn by Dwight Armstrong is based on Psalm 143. Let's make this our prayer as well. That's page 156, The Servant's Prayer. Oh,
servant, Lord. And now for our closing prayer, Alan Holt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, is you on my jacket? Again, there we go. Sorry, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that most of the world has been deceived by the evil one. But thank you for calling and opening our eyes to this. Please continue to help us as we fight against the deception that works to move us further and farther away from you. Strengthen our minds that we can continue to grow closer to you. We look forward to your kingdom of peace and joy, a time when Satan will be no more. Please keep us safe until we meet again next Sabbath. We ask this, of course, in your son Jesus' name. Amen.